This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife Podcast as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to our podcast and also drop me a line what topics you'd like to have covered in the show. Tell me what you're thinking, uh, comment, criticisms of the show. How do you get a hold of me, Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com, Wildlife Control consultant at gmail.com and again we're glad to have you on board so with the coming summer here i've been starting to see a lot of uh postings on facebook where people are dealing with snakes i thought well i should really talk about snake repellents i thought i already done this and i'm looking through my 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 files and lo and behold i never did so let's talk about it now i know i did some blogs on it and we're going to talk about some of the information from my blogs People are desperate for magic to deal with snakes because the phobias regarding snakes are so high. So the desperation from people is truly great and it's something that puts a, poses a danger for you and your company, namely that you can be exploitive of people and their phobias by trying to give them something that may not, may be more of a rabbit's foot. And there's a value in rabbit's foot, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, but where you're giving them more hope than what is justified by the evidence and so let's talk about that so the granddaddy of all snake repellents of course here in the u.s is snake is dr t's snake away what is it well essentially it is uh naphthalene flakes with sulfur i think there might be some other ingredients in as well but those are the two primary active ingredients and the epa registration number is 58630-1 so an epa registration number in this case means that there is evidence that it has efficacy. Where did this evidence come from? Well, the original researcher, from my understanding, is Dr. Harvey Lillywhite of Florida. I think he was from the University of Florida. And he did some research, and what he found was is that snake away had some repellency that ranged anywhere from 17 to 100% re repellency, depending on the species of snake tested. Now, I wasn't able to find a publication of his so I'm looking at sort of an abstract of his information because when you're publishing when you're submitting not publishing when you're submitting something to the EPA it doesn't have to be in peer-reviewed literature although it would certainly help you can provide some internal data perhaps it's something you don't want your competitors to be aware of but you're just giving it to the EPA because there is competition in the pest in the pesticide world obviously so this is something to definitely consider so if any of you are able to get a hold of this original data I would love to see it but anyways it passed the EPA and that's why it has a registration number and it is a legal product to use I believe it is a general use product that it can be used by some homeowners on their own property if you as a professional wildlife control operator pest control operator you have the appropriate pesticide application licenses and insurance you can apply that for your client as well so does the product actually work as advertised? Well, that's part of the controversy. As you can say, even the research that I was able to find said the efficacy, depending on the species, was 17 to 100%. Well, that's a quite a variation, okay? And 100%, wow, that's a, that's a lot because that's very hard for a repellent to ever achieve. I mean, just think if the wind blew a different direction, would the animal even smell it? That's obviously it. But anyways, his research is what it is. So is there any other research that suggests that this particular product works to repel snakes? And the answer is yes. There is some additional research. This is, pub this is an article by Joseph H. Treadway Jr. and other authors, and they wrote a paper which, for the gray literature. This is the National Quail Symposium Proceedings entitled Exclosures, an Experimental Technique for Protection of Northern Bob White Nests. Now, what is gray literature? Gray literature is the step below peer-reviewed journal articles. 
Scientific research has a hierarchy of value, and peer-reviewed is the highest value. And I have another whole podcast where I talk about research journals and how to understand them, so I would refer you over to that. But this is a gray literature. It doesn't mean it's garbage. It just means it's not to the same level as a peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journal, but it is what it is. It's valuable nevertheless. Don't just simply throw it into the bus because it doesn't, it's not peer-reviewed, right? Sometimes... It's too expensive or difficult to get information at the peer-reviewed level, and so we have to rely on gray literature. So this is what we have. What was this particular publication talking about? Well, what the researchers did was they wanted to try to increase recruitment of Bob White Ness. Now, recruitment means is that getting that clutch to survive long enough to leave the nest, to fledge. Okay, that would be recruitment. So then they would be able to be mature to leave the nest. If they're being killed in the nest, obviously there's no recruitment because there's no new Bob Whites to take, replace the parents. This is a problem. They were testing against fire ants and they were testing against snakes. And so they had two different chemicals. One, I've, I believe, obviously was for fire ants and one was for snakes. Bottom line, they found some efficacy for the exclosures with these, with these nests that increased nest rate success by two to one. So if the nest was protected, it had twice the chance of having a successful nest as opposed to those that were not test, not protected. That's pretty significant. Unfortunately, you think, well, it should be a slam dunk, right? I mean, that's pretty two to one. That's a pretty big advantage. It shows there's some efficacy. Yes, but you have to look a little bit deeper into the data. This is why learning how to evaluate the literature is so important. One of the things they didn't do was they didn't do any censuses of snakes in the particular areas they were doing their research in. Now, why is it important? Well, if you don't have a lot of snakes to begin with, how do you know that the nests were, were ever really at a practical threat of snakes? You know, if you only have one snake every square mile, what's the likelihood the snake is going to find the bobwhite nest? Okay, that's... That's a problem, obviously. The other issue was, is they weren't able to tell whether it was the exclosure that protected the nest or whether it was the snake repellent that protected the nest. Well, if you don't know which is which, how do you know, was it a combination of the two? Was it the snake repellent? Was it the exclosure? Don't know. So it may have been just the exclosure and not the snake repellent. It may have been all the snake repellent and not the exclosure. Don't know. So this is obviously a weakness in the study design of this particular test. This is normal for scientific research, right? This is, you know, this is the problem that we have. That is, it's not always the slam dunk we wish that it would be because getting that slam dunk is expensive. And unfortunately, there's not enough research money sometimes to really answer some of these questions. And so it takes time for that to happen. Is there any other research about snake away? Well, the answer is yes, there is. And this would be called negative research. This is where we're having research showing, well, it may not have the kind of effect that we would like it to have. And this was done by Dennis Ferraro, a, pro a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's an herb herpetologist. I know this individual personally. He is the one who kind of made me a little bit more passionate about snakes. I don't own any snakes. I've just kind of become a snake advocate. I think they're cool. And I'm learning to become more comfortable around them as I'm starting to learn more about snakes. So um, I doubt I'm ever going to get over some of the creepiness of it. But I'm definitely... Uh, an advocate for snakes now, and I wish people would stop killing them so much. But in any event, what was his research? Well, let's open up his publication, and you can find that he did the publication called The Efficacy of Naphthalene and Sulfur Repellents to Cause Avoidance Behavior in the Plains Garter Snake. So he was only testing the Plains Garter Snake. That's very important, so we don't want to comment about snakes that he didn't test, right? So he's just testing the plains garter snake, a specific species, and he did this research around Omaha, Nebraska. So you can find this. It was published in the Great Plains Wildlife Damage Control Workshop Proceedings, and you can get a hold of this publication. Just visit my 
blog, wildlifecontrolconsultant.com. Do a search for snake repellents and you'll find my two blog posts and you'll find some links to this information there. So when you open up the article, you find that what he did was he did two different types of studies. One with snakes within their home range. He took some snakes, captured them, and then took them to a different location in their home range, put a four meter strip of naphthalene or sulfur or the actual mixed product, which would have been snake repellent, and he also tried some controls. Released the snakes and seen, and then saw if they would cross these particular barriers, to lack of a better word, these strips of chemical. And then found out if they did, because what was the draw for them to cross it? Well, for them to get back to their original covered habitat where they would feel much safer rather than being exposed. He did another test for snakes outside of their familiar area. He basically relocated or translocated them to a different area that they were unfamiliar with and did the same type of test there to see if they would try to seek potential habitat for themselves and thereby cross the repellent. So you have to have an attractant for the snake to try to cross. So that's what he was doing. He wanted to see if the snakes would cross this repellent to an area where they would want to go. And that's what he did. Did this twice, did different types. So let's take a look at his findings here. So for the experiment number one, he tried 10 snakes with naphthalene, the naphthalene strip. Eight showed no, av no avoidance whatsoever. Two showed avoidance. So that's only a 20% efficacy. For sulfur, he did the same thing with 10 snakes. Nine showed no avoidance. One showed avoidance. So in other words, nine of the 10 snakes crossed the material. For naphthalene, eight of the 10 snakes crossed. Then he tried the mixture, and then he had tried 20 snakes for that study. 15 snakes crossed, five did not. You may say, well, you're showing some efficacy there, Stephen, somewhere between 10 to 25%. That's something. That's true. But then we need to compare it with the controls. He used a blank control. In other words, nothing. And he still had, he tried 10 snakes that way. Two snakes showed avoidance behavior where there was nothing there. This is why you have to evaluate the research. So you may say, well, he had two show avoidance under naphthalene. Yeah, the same amount that showed avoidance, the same percentage amount that showed no avoidance that showed avoidance with a blank control, with nothing there. Not very, doesn't make snake away look very good when you think of that. Why does this happen? Well, because sometimes snakes just do crazy things. Think of it as your crazy uncle. You think everyone in your family, when you raise, when you ask them if they want chocolate ice cream, everyone in the family will say, yes, they want chocolate ice cream. So what's the odds that your uncle will say, will agree? Well, you have a crazy uncle and he says vanilla. Same way with these snakes. So perhaps 20% of the time, snakes are just simply going to move a different direction for no apparent reason because that's what they do. So it's hard to tell. This is why it's difficult to determine repellency sometimes because you have these crazy behaviors. All right. So let's look at test number two. Again, this is with the snakes that were moved to a new location that they were not familiar with. Same type of study, used a barrier, but he didn't use as many snakes this time. With the naphthalene strip, five showed no avoidance whatsoever, one snake showed avoidance. Sulfur, four showed no avoidance, two showed avoidance. Mixture, he used 12 snakes there. 10 showed no avoidance, two showed avoidance. That's even less than what we had with the natives, with the snakes in their native area. So now we have less than, we have like 18% control. Not very good. So ultimately, you have to at least say, in regards to the plains snake, plains garter snake, Dr. The snake away doesn't seem to be that effective. Or we, we could say, because maybe Dr. T's snake away may have changed its formulation, but the formulation at this particular time, as I understand it, wasn't wasn't getting the job done but he was also using pure naphthalene and 
pure sulfur is my understanding when he did this particular study. You can read the article yourself and take it out. So the bottom line is, is that can there be some repellency here? The answer is yes, but you need to be careful how you phrase this with your client. Now, is there any evidence, more evidence for this particular product? The answer is yes, there is. And this is a study done by Dr. the late late Rex Marsh and he's basically sort of a major figure within wildlife control research back in the day he died just several years ago uh, so what he did this is a single page again the same publication again the Great Plains uh, proceedings he basically took two snakes he used gopher snakes that is Petufus melanocleus melan Melano, no, Lucas, Petufus, Melanolucus, and he used he used twelve gopher snakes and then two western rattlesnakes. So not many on the rattlesnake side, and he basically put them in a ten by twenty room, and put X's of the snake away in the room to see if they would cross it. All 12 gopher snakes crossed. Only one of the two pit vipers crossed. And he wasn't sure whether that particular snake was repelled or whether it just wasn't in the mood to scurry around. That's a problem. He wasn't sure. So not a very ringing endorsement. So the bottom line for you is when you are discussing using a snake repellent, such as one of these naphthalene products, you need to be sure that you let your client know that there's no guarantee that it's going to prevent snakes from crossing and coming into the yard or whatever type of barrier you've put up for them. This is going to be a sp particularly important when you're dealing with venomous snakes. Do not get yourself in the situation where you're guaranteeing something or you're insinuating that this is somehow going to be helpful to a level that makes that person feel safe. Now, here's where things get complicated. You may be talking with the, cl with the client because their spouse or their partner is so paranoid about snakes, they're going to leave the house. You may be talking to one of the partners, the partner that's not afraid of snakes, and you may say, look, I'm not suggesting that this repellent is going to be the godsend for you. And they say, I need something. My spouse is going to go to a hotel and leave and sell the house and go crazy. And some people are really that paranoid. And they're desperate for some sort of magic cure or the rabbit's foot that they can give to their partner. You need to be sure that you write this out in your contract. And I would encourage you to talk to your insurance company about this as well to make sure you get the wording out right. That you say, look, if you're... And I'll put this down again if it's if you're properly licensed to put this pesticide down because it is a pesticide by FIFRA. If you're allowed to do that, you make sure you don't oversell what this is getting your client and that your client truly understands that. Now, what your client tells their spouse is between them. You don't have to tell the spouse who's paranoid that, oh, this isn't really going to probably work the way you'd like it to. You can just simply say, talk to your spouse. Let, your, let the spouse lie if they so choose. I would not recommend it, but again, I have a very high definition of integrity. Okay, That's up to them, but it's not your job to get in the middle of that. But you need to be forthright with the client who's paying the bills. And if, I, if you're dealing with a situation where there's a rental, that gets even more complicated. We're talking about just ownership here. I think you might have to talk to a lawyer about the rental issue. Um, but in any event, think about your liability and you want to be sure you are protecting yourself 
while helping a client. Another way of dealing with it is just simply say, uh, client, you can purchase this particular repellent and use it yourself. It is a general use product. You can put this on your own ground. Just be sure to follow the label. And then you're out of it completely. But some of you may want to generate some of that extra revenue. You just don't want to be in the place of overselling it because as you can tell, the evidence for its efficacy, at least for certain species, is pretty weak. Now, am I open to additional information? Absolutely. If you have additional information that I wasn't able to find about this, I would love to see it. And I will do another podcast on it. It would be awesome if we had some barriers to be used for, for snakes, even if we knew, if, if, even if it was species specific, that would be awesome. And maybe there is some efficacy here in terms of, you know, maybe only 50% because one of the problems is your client's going to want 100% efficacy. That's a very high standard for any repellent. And that's not fair in my opinion. However, you need to be sure you write this up and you explain it to your client in a very forthright, clear way that you don't want to be on the other side of this, particularly if you're dealing with a venomous species and someone gets bit, that's a, that's a legal nightmare you do not want to be in. Don't be so hungry for that check that you are exposing yourself to a massive lawsuit. Be wise. Be careful. Do not oversell this repellent. Simple and be sure whatever, if you're applying it, you follow that label to the T. No pun intended there. All right. Sorry, I wish I had some great news that we have, you know, this product that works 80% of the time and the evidence is all for all snakes. We don't have that at this particular moment. It's for all the research, some of it negative, some of it positive, is not as strong or as detailed as I certainly would like. Be careful with this. Your clients are desperately looking for hope and they're not always going to listen to what you're telling them when you're trying to nuance the answer. Make sure it's in writing and they initial it so they can't say they weren't aware of that particular write-up. Do not oversell this. And don't lie to your clients. All right, that's kind of a negative note here today, but I want to definitely, part of my job is not just only to help you make money, but also to save you from losing money and save you from making really damaging mistakes to your business and to your client. So that's what being a pest geek is all about, and we want you to be uh, accurate and faithful so that you can be the type of professional that we all should be striving to be because you do important work in helping clients resolve conflicts with vertebrate animals. It's underappreciated, and we want to be sure that you're doing this faithfully and honestly according to the evidence that we have available. And again, if you have a knowledge of other pieces of evidence or even anecdotal information from your own experience, I would love to hear it. Wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. I think it would be great because I think this is an area of our industry that we definitely need more information about. All right, that's it for me today. I'm Stephen Van Tassel, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody.